Good evening. It is InfoWars Nightly News. The date is the 29th day of September 2011 on this Thursday night transmission. Coming up, we've done a boil down of an interview we did with Dr. Paul Conant on the documented dangers of fluoride in the water. And we have several experts in studio tomorrow night and a report we've been working on for over a week on the dangers of fluoride including footage shot inside the Austin water treatment plant and restaurants in Austin that are putting up signs saying they have special filtration to have fluoride free water. So the revolution against this forced toxic waste medication that's put in our water supply uh, will be aired tomorrow night on the Friday edition, very special edition of InfoWars Nightly News. It's so important for you, members of PrisonPlanet.tv viewers, uh, to get this uh, report tonight and tomorrow night out to everybody you know, and it is you out there that are making this possible. Then Mike Adams, with some incredible revelations and a challenge, he's announcing for environmentalists coming up uh, at the end of tonight's transmission. But first, some of the top stories tonight. I've seen this hundreds of times in just the last few years, and it happened again. You always hear the big uh, news announcements. My God, a guy wanted to blow up the Capitol and the Pentagon. And then you learn, and they admit, that the government basically sought out a nut, gave them the little airplane, gave them the plastic explosive, gave them the guns, gave them the hand grenades, and he was being led by the FBI. So the FBI uh, has uh, stopped their own terror plot, kind of like in 19. 93 with the first World Trade Center attack where they cooked the bomb, trained the driver, and let it all go forward. That was all confirmed at the time. Absolutely amazing that that's going on. You know, we've been covering the Occupy Wall Street movement that's quite diverse uh, that's been happening now for almost two weeks uh, there in lower Manhattan. And we've since seen a video of women just trying to videotape people being arrested for no reason, being pepper sprayed. Uh, by uh, Tony Baloney. That was the name of the officer that actually did that. You can't make this stuff up out of central casting. Uh, this, the name certainly fits. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Baloney. I'm not bashing folks with the name Baloney, but you got to admit it's funny. I mean, this is Baloney. This is happening. Uh, and now it's been confirmed uh, that multiple journalists, you see one of the articles on screen, would just be trying to videotape or photograph from a distance, and cops would beat them up. And then, of course, that was caught on camera, and then they would beat up that person. But there's so many cameras, they can't stop the signal from getting out to people. And regardless of what do you think of the Wall Street protesters, you should support their free speech, or we're just like China with Tiananmen Square. All right, we're going to go ahead and go to this very important uh, interview with Dr. Paul Conant on the documented dangers of fluoride. I think the most important thing to recognize about fluoride is that it's extremely toxic. It is very active biologically, interfering with many basic biochemical processes, uh, enzymes, G proteins, hydrogen bonds, and so on. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. But the bottom line is that fluoride is extremely active biologically, that the first opponents of fluoridation going back to the 1950s were biochemists, inclu including scientists like James Sumner, who won a, a Nobel Prize for enzyme chemistry. And incidentally, there is no doubt that fluoride damages health because millions of people in India, China, and parts of Africa have had their health ruined by fluoride. The people have been crippled by fluoride and many other health effects. The argument as far as fluoridation is concerned is, is there an adequate margin of safety between the doses which cause this known harm and incidentally documented in this report by the National Research Council published in 2006. Here in a fairly independent balanced panel looked at the literature for three years and in this 507 page report and 1100 references indicated that the EPA safe drinking water standard for fluoridation for fluoride is four parts per million it's not safe it's not protective of health and needs to be lowered but before I get into the health effects let me explain my first concern which remains my top concern the level of fluoride in mother's milk mother's breast milk baby's first meal is extremely low. It's 0.004 parts per million. 
That means a bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community in the United States, where we fluoridate the water at one part per million, is getting 250 times higher dose of fluoride than a breastfed baby. And that is extremely disturbing. This is a hazardous waste. No question about it. It's not only hexafluorosilicic acid, but it's a lot of crap that Neil was talking about. It's got lead and arsenic and mercury and radioactive uh, isotopes, maybe trace amounts. They can't dump that into the sea by international law. They can't dump it locally because it's too concentrated. But wait for it. If someone buys it from them, it's, it, it, you take away the label hazardous waste and it becomes a product. It becomes a product. And who's going to buy this stuff from them? Oh, our water department. So the water departments buy this hazardous waste, it becomes a product, and now they put it in our drinking water. And now, let me go through the list of health concerns. Some of them are more certain than others. Let me begin with the certain one. Dental fluorosis. Fluoride causes a discoloration, mottling of the tooth enamel. When this practice began in 1945, the promoters of fluoridation thought they could limit dental fluorosis to 10% of the children in its very mild form. And the very mild form has little specks of, of uh, white, opaque patches on the cusp of the teeth, up to 25%. And they thought that only dentists would notice this. And was an acceptable trade-off with what they thought would be a lowering of tooth decay. Well, in November of 2010, the Center of Disease Control told us that children aged 12 to 15 in the United States, 41% of them now have dental fluorosis. And not only the very mild, but the mild, which impacts up to 50% of the tooth surface, moderate, which impacts up to 100% of the tooth surface, and severe, where you not only have the whole surface impacted, but indentations, chipping of the teeth, and so on. And 3.6% of children aged 12 to 15 in the United States have either moderate or severe dental fluorosis. So that, that trade-off between lowering tooth decay and um, producing dental fluorosis but holding it only to 10% clearly was a failure. We have four times more dental fluorosis as intended and as desired. Our attitude is that when you see this dental fluorosis, it means the child has been overexposed to fluoride, and the question is what other tissues have been affected. So let's start with the bone, because the teeth are a window into the bone. In fact, the teeth actually grow out of the, the jaw, the jaw bone. And by the time the permanent teeth have come out, the jaw bone has been loaded up with fluoride. And so if you can see the damage to the growing tooth cells, what did the fluoride do to the growing bone cells during this 8, 9, 10 period? In fact, the first study that was published on this in 55 indicated that the children in the fluoridated community, which was Newburgh, New York, had twice as much uh, cortical bone defects as the children in the non-fluoridated community. Now, the cortical bone is the outside layer of the bone and that's the layer it's a lamellar structure and that part of the bone is meant to protect against fractures and so the, the the concern then is whether we're increasing bone fractures in children well we had to wait until 2001 before someone investigated this and the researchers in Mexico found a linear a correlation as the severity of dental fluorosis went up meaning the amount of fluoride the child had been exposed to before the permanent teeth had erupted. As that went up, so did bone fractures in the children. And it was quite striking. When you go from no dental fluorosis to very mild dental fluorosis, it doubled. The, the bone fractures doubled. Very mild to mild, doubled again. Mild to moderate, doubled again. The next concern about bone is that the first symptoms of bone poisoning in an adult are just like arthritis, uh, stiff joints, pains in the joints, pains in the bone. 
In the United States, we have one in three adults now with some form of arthritis. And if you ask a doctor what's causing it, um, they will say, well, we don't really know, but we think it's got something to do with aging. Well, what also parallels aging, of course, is the number of years you spent in a fluoridated community, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, eventually 60, 70, and so on. The next concern is, is as the fluoride continues to build up in the bone, and I should say that up to 50% of all the fluoride that we take in each day accumulates in the bone. The fluoride is bioaccumulative. Um, the bones get more brittle. And another major concern is increased hip fractures in adults. The studies done in China, as documented in this National Research Council report, and we further elaborated in our book, The Case Against Fluoride, indicates that levels as low as three milligrams per day, that's three liters of fluoridated water per day, may increase hip fractures in the elderly. Now my major concern is not the bones, although I think that's significant, my major concern is the brain. Because when the baby is born, the blood-brain barrier is not fully formed. We think the blood-brain barrier keeps fluoride out of the brain most of the time, but for the first half year of the baby's life, the fluoride can get into the brain. And this is not the time, in my view, and the view of many other scientists, that a baby should be exposed to fluoride at 250 times the level in mother's milk. There have now been over 100 animal studies which shows that fluoride damages the brain. There have also been 23 IQ studies, most of them from China, but one from India, one from Iran, and one from Mexico, which show an association between moderate exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ in children. And I actually vi visited the villages where one of these studies was done. It was a very good study. They controlled for lead. They controlled for iodine. Most of the, uh, the villages were almost identical. The two villages were almost identical, except for the fact that their well water was different. And the author of this study estimated that the f IQ would be lowered at 1.9 parts per million. And that offers no adequate margin of safety for children drinking water at one parts per million when you consider the massive range of sensitivity to any toxic effect and the fact that once you put fluoride in the water you can't control the dose. Another concern which many of us have had for many years is fluoride's impact on the thyroid gland. For between the 30s and the 50s doctors in Argentina, France and Germany were giving patients with hyper thyroidism, overactive thyroid gland, sodium fluoride tablets to lower thyroid function. And the doses that they were using were between 2.5 and 4.5 milligrams per day, which is exceeded by many people drinking fluoridated water. For example, the Institute of Medicine actually advises people to drink three liters of water a day. So clearly then they would be in the range for lowered thyroid function. And once again, as in many of these other issues, the fluoridating countries, including the United States, are simply not doing the studies. They're not investigating to see if there's a relationship between fluoridation and lowered IQ, fluoridation and arthritis, fluoridation and hypothyroidism. Key health studies have not been done in fluoridated countries. If you don't look, you don't find. They would like to imply, because they don't see anything, there's nothing wrong, but if they're not looking, they won't find. You often hear the promoters say things like, oh, we've been doing this for 60 years. If there's any problem, we would know about it by now. Oh, no, you wouldn't, unless you were doing the studies. Another issue that came out in 1997 was a researcher in England found that fluoride accumulated in the human pineal gland. And the pineal gland is a little gland between the two parts of the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain. It's not protected by the blood-brain barrier. It has a high perfusion rate of blood. And it also is a calcifying tissue like the teeth and the bones. And so this researcher hypothesized that fluoride would be attracted to this tissue, this little gland, like a magnet. And sure enough, when she investigated the average level of fluoride on these 
little calcium hydroxyapatite crystals was 9,000 parts per million up to 21,000 parts per million, which means that this little gland has a higher concentration of fluoride than any other tissue in the body, including the bone. This researcher, Jennifer Luke, also did animal studies, and in the animal studies, she found that fluoride lowered the production of melatonin, the hormone that this little gland makes, and incidentally, it only makes it at night, the hormone of darkness, uh, this pineal gland re reacts to light. It, uh, Descartes called it the seat of the soul. Not only did it lower melatonin levels in these animals, but also shorten the time to puberty, which is absolutely consistent. Uh, uh, melatonin is thought to be, act like a biological clock, involved with timing, timing of puberty, timing of aging, timing of a jet, uh, lag and um, sleeping patterns and so on. Controls all kinds of things. And what they think happens that with a child at birth, the melatonin levels are high and with childhood they gradually lower and at a certain point the lowered melatonin levels trigger the production of the sex hormones leading to um, puberty. Ironically, that first study that was published, which I already referred to in the bones, also recorded that the young girls in the Floridated community, Newburg, were menstruating on average five months earlier than the young girls in the non-Floridated community. Now they didn't think that was significant at the time. Now with Jennifer Luke's work, it is clearly, um, had, takes on a new perspective. Kids now are reaching puberty seven, eight, nine. It has people very, very worried. But once again, the fluoridating countries have made absolutely no effort to reproduce Jennifer Luke's work. And it's not difficult, they could have done it easily. The Department of Health and Human Services has adopted to this, quote, sacred policy of fluoridation is to deny, 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 critique the methodologies, but don't attempt to reproduce the studies. If you don't look, you don't find. And they're using the absence of study as if it was the same as the absence of harm, which is absolutely ridiculous, utterly irresponsible. So now they're, they're giving every indication, particularly the center of disease control that avidly promotes fluoridation around the United States and around the world for that matter. The impression that they give is that it's more important now to protect this practice than to protect the health of um, the American people and our babies and our children. It's almost as if the teeth have become the most important tissue, the most important organ in the body, instead of our brains, instead of our thyroid glands, instead of our pineal glands, instead of our kidneys. Well, a truly amazing boil down of the highlights of our interview we did that's over an hour long with Dr. Paul Conant. The full interview is posted here at PrisonPlanet.tv as well. We're going to go to break and come back in studio with the one, the only, the Health Ranger, Mike Adams. Stay with us. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is, and it's not in a president. Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight. In the bed, in the bed, in the bed, in the bed, in the bed. Well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election. The elite are using Obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the North American Union by stealth launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. You've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. 
President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right? No, everything's not going to be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception. The truth strikes back. Get your copy of The Obama Deception today at InfoWars.com or download it in super high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. We are back. It's InfoWars Nightly News on this September 29th, 2011, Thursday edition. And we've got such an incredible amount of health freedom news uh, right now that I wanted to get Mike Adams of naturalnews.com, the health ranger, here in studio to recap uh, the incredible uh, last few days. Uh, their confirmed report with the letter from the Department of Health and Human Services calling up, basically harassing people, asking them if they've had their shots. Uh, we've got a judge in Wisconsin ruling that you can't grow your own food or have your own uh, cow for your own milk, saying the police power won't allow that. Just incredible. And uh, we have other things happening. Uh, like Chuck Norris coming out and saying GMO is dangerous, it should be labeled. And uh, and the reason that's important is he's seen as kind of a right-wing figure, and they've tried to make it left-wing environmental stuff, right-wing, you know, other issues. The point is, this affects everybody. And I've noticed that the environmentalists, I want to cover the Chuck Norris thing first with you, Mike. The system is great at controlling the cancer associations, to, ever, to never look at all the real cures and treatments or they're really great at having government institutions and groups that look at missing children. And then you find out that's so DynCorp and Halliburton and the UN can actually run the kidnapped kids and not get in trouble. So the criminals tend to try to lead the resistance to themselves. Uh, and they try to make it a liberal conservative issue. You know, they have the environmentalist going after uh, carbon dioxide that plants live off of and that is uh, point you know, zero, three, six, zero percent of the atmosphere, and it's very low right now. But then they want to ignore toxic waste dumping, Fukushima exploding, like a hundred Hiroshima's or Nagasaki's. I mean, the biggest nuclear disaster in history. Uh, they don't want to focus on GMO. We are biological creatures that were developed on this planet through a process, and 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 now we're not supposed to even debate hundreds of companies randomly splicing everything, and in all the studies of the GMO, it's, it's causing sterilization in the rodents. All the health problems that mirror that happening in our populations. And that's why I wanted to raise this point first, because Mayor Bloomberg came out today, this is Cyber News Service, and said, quote, government's highest duty is to push healthy foods, but he wants to arrest you if you have too much salt in your restaurant in New York, or too much fat. In st but see, that's a red herring. Sure, those things probably aren't good, it's, oh, the government's going to protect you from things, but we say GMOs and vaccines are good. So again, they're try, uh, trying to lead the opposition. And, th and this is a central point for me uh, that's really key to understanding how they co-opt reasonable environmentalism turned into a carbon tax. Or they co-opt concerns about really unhealthy food we're being fed, and they're actually got us distracted off into fats or salt when that's nothing compared to, to, to GMO and additives. So here is the expert uh, to talk about that, Mike Adams here in studio. Mike, great to have hey, you. Alex, good to be here. Let's cover this piece first. Well, I'm really glad you brought up this piece because the, this issue in particular, we've got to expose the idea that it's completely a false paradigm that the government should be telling you what to eat in the first place. We've got to get the government out of the way of these processed foods and to stop subsidizing corn syrup, for example, stop subsidizing sugar. What we've got to do is get the government to, to enable food freedom. 
so that we can actually choose the kinds of foods that we want to consume, whether it's raw milk or GMO-free foods or have honest labeling, labeling on those foods so that we're not uh, buying GMOs. What Bloomberg is saying is that the government should be telling us what to eat and what not to eat. And if that happens, we're going to get a distorted message that is hijacked by industry and we're going to end up with very unhealthy processed dead foods rather than healthy foods anyway so so bloomberg is wrong on this count we got to get back to freedom and liberty about foods not government telling us what to eat mike chuck norris is making the point that we at least have a right to have gmo label but government whether it's salmon that's been crossed with insects or whatever the case is they don't want us to have a right to know if milk has growth hormone in it Obviously, Big Pharma that's created uh, this modern Frankensteinian type system, they know what they're doing. But from your research, what is GMO doing to people? I mean, looking out there to TV land, tell folks what's in the GMO. Well, GMO is just based on a pack of lies. I mean, number one, they say GMOs have higher yields. They don't. That's a complete fabrication. Number two, they say that GMOs are safe for consumption, and yet all the studies consistently show that GMOs have very dangerous and undesirable side effects, including potentially widespread infertility. You know, the, the fact that the BT genes in the corn can theoretically then interact with the genetic code of the bacteria in your own gut, it can turn you into a pesticide factory where you're actually producing pesticide chemicals in your own body and from that, it's no wonder that people might have chronic fatigue. It's no wonder they might have immune suppression. I mean, people often, they wonder, why do I feel so sick or why do I feel so tired? GMOs could be a very key part of that answer. But, but ultimately, Alex, this is about the, this, this, it's a campaign of ignorance that the industry is trying to push on the American people to say that you don't have the right to know you're eating GMOs. The FDA and the USDA, they don't want them labeled. They don't want you to be able to read a label and say, oh, what, is there GMO in this food or not? And even Whole Foods has not taken, in my opinion, a, enough of a stand to say we're going to eliminate GMOs from our stores. But I think this is going to change, Alex. I think. I know there's some good news coming up next week. I think there are going to be more grassroots efforts to let people know that we demand honest labeling of GMOs so that we can make a choice, Alex. And, and they've also capitulated at Whole Foods, where I like to shop. They, a few months ago, put a sign up, as you know, saying there's so much GMO, even in so-called organic now, we can no longer say that we're GMO free. And you just brought up the fact that uh, this can make microorganisms that produce pesticide. The public may not know that BT, that's being engineered into a lot of different plants, uh, corn and other things, grows its own pesticide yeah. pharmacologically uh, so that bugs can't eat it. Now, honeybees are like humans. They'll go ahead and still uh, get the pollen, and that's one thing in German studies has been linked to uh, part of the cocktail of reasons, uh, as you know, they're dying. So right there, uh, I mean, just backing up what you were saying, that we're getting chronic bowel problems exploding, cancer exploding. I mean, if you look at the countries with the GMO, they also have the highest vaccination. North America, New Zealand, Australia, highest cancer rates. You can follow these maps and you can see that what's happening in the lab animals is also happening with humans. The problem is you can test the life cycle of a rat in a year or so. With humans, it takes 20, 30, 40, 50 years just to see generationally what's happening, but we're already in the first generation mirroring the reduced fertility, the increased cancer in the first generation. But as you know, by the third generation of these major studies that multiple governments and institutions have done, by third generation, rats, guinea pigs, mice, near total sterilization, uh, all sorts of mutations. Uh, my God, I mean, this is incredible. Yeah, it's it's like we are living out a tick, a ticking time bomb, a multi generational time bomb. And there's even more to it than what you just said, Alex. Remember that these biotech companies are running experiments with injecting crops with genes to grow vaccines. So if they take this to the next logical step, which they do because they always push it too far when they're playing God with seeds, they could have you start eating your vaccine corn. Well, like Bill Gates says a decade ago, that's the plan is to have pharmacological crops where you don't have a choice. And again, because plants just don't have one daddy or one mommy, they can have 1%, 5%, whatever from pollen that hits them. We already know the GMO has infected most of the corn right. varieties in the world. It's going to spread these pharmacological crops into everything. 
Yeah, the, 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 the spreading is out of control, and it's a Pandora's box. You can't put these genes back in the box and control them. This is, I've, I've said it on your show, I said it earlier today, Alex, GMOs are the greatest environmental catastrophe that has ever been unleashed on our planet. And this is why I, I'm saying so strongly that anyone who wants to have any credibility as a so-called environmentalist, they must speak out against GMOs. And that's, that's sort of an appeal to perhaps the left. But then we have this wonderful action by courageous patriots such as Chuck Norris on the right who are now standing up against GMOs. Good for him. And that's what scares the system. Absolutely. They want to make common sense left or right when it belongs to everybody. Yeah, and isn't it beautiful that people are getting this on, on both sides of the aisle? Because this is really a human rights, even a civil rights issue. This, this is about it's a property the right. They're contaminating yes. our bodies, yes. our farms, our lives with their garbage. It is an assault on the future of life on our planet. I mean, that's what it is. If you believe in protecting life, whether you're a conservative or a liberal or progressive, an independent, libertarian, it doesn't matter. Everyone should be concerned with protecting life on our planet, especially the future of human life. Not to mention crop life and seeds and can seeds propagate generation after generation. It's all generation. interconnected, and that goes yes. back to the beginning. The left, the big Soros outfits, have tried to keep environmentalism about carbon dioxide or about just rainforest or something like that. Instead of the, the basics of life, GMO that is engaged in a corporate takeover of society. Now, in the time we've got left, this is all up at naturalnews.com, and you're always gracious enough to let us mirror your work at infowars.com, at least some of the great workers. There's so much, it's very prolific. But let's run through what you've discovered this week. Uh, on the heels of in California, they're going door to door saying we're here for your fourth inoculation with no law behind them. There is a law on the governor's desk to give kids shots without parental con uh, consent. But now, headline, CDC now calling U.S. households and demanding child immunization records as part of a vaccine surveillance and tracking program. Tell us about this. All right. This is a CDC-led phone interrogation program. It is a, an admitted vaccine surveillance and compliance tracking program. And those are their own words. That's the way they describe it. It involves researchers from the University of Chicago who call your house and demand you produce your child immunization records so that they can then compile reports of which areas of the country have vaccination rates that are too low so that they can have more vaccination efforts and certainly more propaganda in those areas to boost vaccination rates, which they call public health. But we really know what it's all about. It's really about giving children degenerative disease, weakening their immune systems, making the population more susceptible to outbreaks of pandemics, which no doubt lie in our very near future. Because we've seen companies like, remember Baxter Pharmaceuticals was shipping live viral material in the vaccine material. We've seen Dr. Maurice Hilleman, former uh, Merck vaccine scientist, admitting that vaccines contain up to 40 different stealth viruses that have not been identified, many of which may cause cancer. Vaccines, this is the big story, Alex, is that vaccines are becoming the channel through which infectious, infectious disease will be spread throughout the population. Vaccines are the entry point. They don't, they don't prevent infectious disease, they infect the population. Well, even governments funded studies three years ago on the H1N1, or two and a half years ago, in Canada found that it doubled your chances of getting the regular flu yeah. if you took the H1N1 shot. Even the flu vaccine, we did a study or a research on this, 99 out of, out of 100 people who get the seasonal flu shot have no benefit from it whatsoever. And even the one out of 100 is a dubious benefit self-reported by the drug companies. But it's incredible. Taking a flu shot would work great if you're a time traveler because it's last year's viral strain. So if you have a time machine and you believe in the vaccines, then take the flu shot, go back to last year, and you might be protected. But if you're not a time traveler, flu shots make absolutely no sense, Alex. No, it is a total hoax within a hoax. <laughs> and the good news is people are getting wise to the hoax. I know you've seen this report uh, out of Wisconsin. Uh, the state judge says no right to produce or eat food they're arresting people uh, that allow folks to store cows at their at their dairies and yeah. then b because they want the fresh milk. It's like a private club, like in the old dry counties, you could go to a club where you're allowed to drink. Well, this is drinking milk, and uh, I have the judge's ruling right here. He says there's plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right 
to board their cow at the farm of a farmer. And, uh, and it says, uh, the Zinnaker plaintiff's private contract does not fall outside the scope of the state's police power. Number five, no plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to produce and consume foods of their choice. That is the big bombshell right there. And that's why we have the headline, no right to produce or eat your own food. I mean, this is just incredible. This is parroting the new paradigm of command and control economies, of crony capitalism, of a police state government that's running a, a medical police state and a food police state that really says, you are a slave and you're going to eat what we tell you to eat and you have no fundamental right to choose what you want to consume or to choose what type of medicine you want to uh, treat your children with or even yourself. This is the state mandating to you how to live your life, what kind of toilet you can have, uh, banning asthma inhalers, which the EPA has, has done recently. They, they want to control every little aspect of our lives. In Alex. other words, put down that carrot and back up slowly, as this article says. <laughs> yeah. Anything it's, you eat or grow can and will be used to get you uh, in a court of law. It's, it's incredible, but th this is them setting the stage to make mass arrests of gardeners and farmers. If you, think, if you think Julie Bass was outrageous, wait till they do it. And by the way, the folks, don't say this can't be happening. This is happening here. Uh, look at all over the country. Life in prison for filming cops in public. And even when the courts throw it out, they keep arresting people. I mean, we've got a bunch of crooks in government who are paid off by big corporations who are exempt. You're going to be arrested for filming cops at your own traffic stop or at your own protest, but and then charged and face 15 years to life in Illinois or 11 other states. But if OnStar wants to record you and track you and sell it to the feds, that's okay. Well, then, like this news, if the CDC wants to interrogate you by phone and track your child immunization records and then use those for some kind of government study or maybe even to build a list of which parents are refusing vaccination policies, how is that list going to be used against you in the future? Look, if you're, if you're an InfoWars reader or listener, you know how that's going to be used against you. It's going to be used to round up parents who are against vaccines. Every list that goes into the hands of the government eventually becomes abused. Uh, that, that raises my last point before I get into your challenge that's coming up next week that I think is an admirable uh, idea. Normal's website, Working to Reform Marijuana Laws, feds to legal marijuana, uh, medical marijuana patients. You don't have Second Amendment rights, period. And reading this new extrajudicial letter, they just send it out saying, I don't care what the state law is. You can't sell guns to a medical marijuana card holder and basically opens the door now to start raiding people, uh, not for their marijuana, but because they're a medical marijuana user and own a gun. Uh, this is very, very, very dangerous. And just three months ago, they wrote letters saying, we don't have a law, but we, if, you, if somebody buys more than one rifle, uh, call the ATF, even though it's going through an FBI instant background check. It's all about their arbitrary power grab. Well, as you have stated many times accurately on, on this show and on, on InfoWars Radio, your Alex Jones radio show, disarmament is the pathway to slavery. And the ATF uh, realizes that for them to stay in power, they've got to have more guns out there so they can react against it. The DEA realizes that if they want to go after the medical marijuana license holders, the best way to do that is to make sure that they are disarmed first. And the FBI is part of this, this whole game as well. So this is just another pathway to disarmament of innocent people in America who do have their Second Amendment rights, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with owning a gun yourself. You must admit that people have their First Amendment rights and their Second Amendment rights, and for those to be encroached upon by the federal government arbitrarily, without any kind of law passed by Congress, is yet another violation of your Bill of Rights. And it is frightening, but... I don't take that fear and cower, and, and, and neither do you. We realize we got to do something to turn this around. Now, your idea, because we always challenge him, you do, I do, many others do. Hey, environmentalists, stop freaking out uh, over some carbon dioxide that we need to pay Lord Rothschild or Gore. Let's focus on what's really going on. Uh, you know, we know cancer is doubling and tripling. We know diabetes is. We know in the studies GMO is devastating. You know, we have. Uh, proof. You know, the facts are in on this, and it just gets worse by the minute. And so, uh, break down, just give us a preview of uh, your, uh, your challenge next week that you're going to have the Natural News team focus on to environmentalists, uh, because this is how the system co-ops legitimate 
care about our, our environment yeah. and, and shunts it off uh, into one area, carbon dioxide, thus, because you know, it'd be one thing if they were bashing carbon dioxide and then were upset about GMO and toxic right. waste dumping or, 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 or Fukushima. Yeah. But they don't care about anything that's demonstrably dangerous. No, it's, Alex, it's a case of selective environmentalism, cherry picking the topics that they want to focus on and ignoring the real issues that impact us. And there are many of them. And we are going to come out with videos and articles on Natural News next week. And I, I hope some of that will be published here on InfoWars as well. But look at three simple issues, okay? One is GMOs. If you're not speaking out against GMOs, you can't call yourself an environmentalist because that's the greatest environmental threat of our, our time. What about mercury in modern dentistry? Do you know how many tons of mercury are dumped into the environment? Or in vaccines. And in vaccines, yes. But just because of modern dentistry and the fact that they still use mercury fillings and put them in the mouths of innocent children, even though they know it will cause neurological damage. What about the pharmaceutical runoff? There are entire rivers in India downstream from the pharmaceutical manufacturing plants that are just running with antibiotics and artificial Wait a synthetic minute. hormones. They found a lot of the shrimp are dying in the Gulf here yeah. just from Prozac exactly. runoff. And the fish in, in rivers and streams and lakes near cities are now contaminated with painkillers and with HRT drugs. Look, these are environmental threats too. And why aren't the environmentalists speaking out against the cancer industry dumping its chemotherapy into the environment through the blood of the people being treated with chemo? Why aren't they talking about mercury and dental fillings? Why aren't they talking about GMOs? And the answer, Alex, is because they have no credibility as environmentalists. They are selective cherry-picking liars. They don't care about the environment. They just care about one issue that they want to control you over, and that happens to be CO2, because that's where they can make money. It is fraud and I'm sick of it and that's why we're exposing it well I mean I know you're a great researcher but I've had so many climatologists people on and, and the media is like oh they're oil company funded well I'm not and I actually yeah. see the oil companies in many cases are actually funding the carbon tax uh, yeah. I mean that's the truth but regardless I've looked at the record 200,000 years ago CO2 was like 14 times higher than it is now uh, it was 30% uh, of the atmosphere millions of years ago, the ice core studies and show. Now it's... It's like a fraction. Well, yeah, now it's, it's exactly, it's, it's 0 0.0360. And clearly it follows temperature increases, then it goes up. And the point is, is that carbon dioxide is not a toxic waste. And, 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 and sure, if they weren't doing the GMOs and all this other stuff, like I said, I might listen to them, but the facts are... They admit they're a bunch of eugenicists, and they're the very ones that just want an anti-life agenda to be able to corner the entire global market by taxing this. Mike Adams, uh, naturalnews.com, thank you so much for spending time with us, and thank you for uh, guest hosting the radio show. Oh, my pleasure, Alex. Anytime that I can help your cause here, let me know. I'm Mike, happy to join you. Thanks a million. I am definitely going to want you on next week, and we're going to be uh, obviously posting uh, your articles up at Natural. Uh, news.com over at Infowars.com because this is very exciting what Mike and his team are doing. We're really changing a uh, history together. All of us, you the viewers, the activists out there especially, and if you believe in this type of information, please take these videos, download them, and spread them to your friends. We'll be back tomorrow night. Aaron Dykes will be guest hosting Infowars uh, Nightly News. Uh, and please don't forget to subscribe or to give subscriptions to your friends and family at prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com. I'm Alex Jones signing off for the Infowars family. See you back tomorrow.